This past January, another sad moment um, in humanity. Uh, in Denver, a young boy was killed by uh, a lady's living boyfriend, three-year-old boy. And the boy was on life support, and the daughter, the mom, had called her dad, the boy's grandpa, and said, you know, this has happened. And, and he wanted to get there to be with her while the boy was on life support. Um, he was only on life support so that they could harvest his organs. And so when they unplugged the machines, the, the grandfather wanted to be there with his daughter and uh, obviously his, his grandson. But there were problems with the flights. And there was all sorts of delays. And it just seemed like it wasn't going to make it. And uh, it was a connecting flight, and it seemed like he, was, he wasn't going to be able to get there in time. But when he arrived at, at one of the airports, the pilot was there waiting for him at the gate and said, Are you Mark? And he said, Yes, I am. And he said, We held the plane for you, and we're sorry about the loss of your grandson. They can't go anywhere without me, and I'm not going anywhere without you. Look, those words, I thought, are just so profound. And I thought that they, they set the tone for what I want to share with you this morning. Um, they can't go anywhere without me, and I'm not going anywhere without you. Beautiful sentence. And a wonderful gesture and an occasion like that. There is embedded in the Old Testament a verse of Scripture that has found its way to many plaques on our walls and, and prints that we frame. There are words that are spoken by the great leader Joshua to the Hebrew people. And he was challenging them to make a decision for themselves as to who they were going to serve. <coughs> were, they, were they going to serve the gods of the Amorites and, and so on? Or would they choose to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And he said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to, to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will choose. And then he declared to the, to the people his own choice. He said, but as for me and my household, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that verse resonates with a chord in our hearts. It, it, there's something about it. There, we, we admire the intentionality, the decisiveness, the, we appreciate the forthrightness. There's no hesitation or shame in Joshua's words. He's bold in his position. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My in-laws have it up right in their kitchen. It takes up a whole wall, but it's for me and my house. We will serve them. But really, can Joshua speak for his whole household? Can he? In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're praying and singing hymns at midnight. I can just imagine the mood of the jailer. He wants these guys to just shut up. But they're praising God at midnight. Eventually the jailer falls asleep. And the scriptures tell us that suddenly there's a violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison are shaken. The chains, the shackles on the prisoner's arms are loosened. And the jailer wakes up. And he sees the prison doors open. And he believes that the prisoners have escaped. And he grabs his sword to kill himself. Because he knows that the leaders of the day are going to hold him responsible. So he goes to kill himself. And just as he's going to thrust the sword into his own belly, Paul, because it's Paul and Silas that were being held there, Paul says to him, don't harm yourself. We are all still here. The jailer calls for lights. He rushes in. He falls trembling before Paul and Silas. And he asks them, sirs, what must I do in order to be saved? Now he's not talking about his physical life at this point. He's talking about his spiritual life. The consequences of his, of his sinful behavior, he realizes that these men represent something much larger than anything he has ever understood or believed before. And they reply to him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. You and your household. Now many people have assumed from those words that if the jailer put his faith in God, not only he but his whole family would be saved. But that's not the whole story. Paul and Silas, we are told in the next verse, not only spoke to the jailer, but the jailer invites them back to his home at midnight. 
gets everybody out of bed. You know, nobody's up at midnight back in those days. I mean, they have little oil lamps to stay awake uh, just to, you know, 9.30 or whatever. So everyone gets roused up, and Paul and Silas share salvation's message with the whole family. And everyone decides for themselves. That night, they were all baptized because they all believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as much as we would like to believe that one person can decide for many, no person or parent decides on behalf of their whole family that they will all serve the Lord. They might pray that way, but they cannot make the decision. It doesn't work that way. The parent decides on his or her own behalf and then endeavors to influence each family member to make a favorable decision to believe on Christ, to choose the Lord as their Savior. And you've probably noticed in your own world that you can't make anybody believe what you believe. Have you noticed that? Have you ever tried? You may be able to manage some of their behaviors, especially if they're your children. You can modify their behaviors, but you can't make them believe what you believe. It's a decision they have to make on their own. <coughs> my prayer and my efforts within our own household are set to the tune, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But understanding that Rebecca, Joe, and Maggie, and even Susie, they have a mind of their own. <laughs> And they will make their own faith decisions. And that is the right thing to do. I cannot dictate to them what they will believe. I think of a child who's told by the teacher to sit down and be quiet. And so the student, begrudgingly, sits down, but before they're quiet says, I may be sitting down and quiet, but on the inside, I am standing up and shouting. <laughs> can't tell a person what to believe or what to think. <coughs> We're told that at the hour of the night, the jailer took Paul and Solomon to his home, washed their wounds. The whole family did believe the message. They were baptized. It says in Scripture, the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The whole household came to believe in God that night for what had happened. They all made a decision. It was wonderful. What a wonderful moment. And I'm certain there is no person here. I mean, you're in church here today, so I know it's an expression of faith in Jesus Christ. I'm sure there's no person here who would not want their whole family, their whole household, to share their faith, to know the joy that comes in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, having Him as your Savior. So the question emerges, in what ways can you influence your household to put their faith in Christ? How can you be an agent of influence? Well, we're going to start out with a little bit of a sober thought, that being upon your death. Upon your death, you can leave your children, and the scripture actually talks about your grandchildren and inheritance. It says in the scriptures that a good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. So, you leave something that is going to have an impact even beyond your life. At death, you leave something. But it doesn't have to be money. An inheritance goes way beyond that. That's unfortunate. That's the way so many people are wired. It can be something that deposits faith into them. It might be a Bible. It might be a special book. It might be a meaningful item that demonstrates your love and affection to them, but also shows them your heart and, and, and influences them to turn to Christ. Does that make sense? It's an inheritance, a meaningful inheritance. And having said that, I want you to listen very closely to these words. In fact, I'm going to repeat it. The inheritance we accumulate and leave for our children is not as important as the personal legacy we leave in them. The inheritance we accumulate and leave for our children is not as important as the personal legacy we leave inside them. We're trying to influence them from the inside. Another expression of influence at your death is to contribute to your own funeral. I encourage people to have a file prepared with your old te your testimony written inside it that I could share with your family. Favorite scripture verses, hymns, sentimental thoughts, affectionate words to your family. These, this is a way you can intentionally, even beyond your life, through your death, have an influence. But really, why would you wait until you die to encourage your family to serve the Lord? You're alive now, right? This is the best time to try to be an influencer. 
<coughs> so let me serve to you right now a basic meal and how you can influence your household. Just using the scriptures while you're alive. Francis of Assisi, his philosophy was this, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. His philosophy is that actions speak louder than words. He's talking about be an example. Model the Christian faith. Jesus told his followers, I have set for you an example. Paul echoed those words to the churches he planted. He said, you could follow the example I have set. Would you be proud if your children followed your example? Do you feel that your example is sturdy enough that your neighbors could follow your example and find the Lord? This is, this is how we influence by the way we live. Mark 12, 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love is... You are to love life and to love the Lord with, with passion. This is the example you are to set, to set, Psalm 103. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear Him, and His righteousness with their children's children. Notice the legacy passed on here? With those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. If you're an individual that is committed to God, to the extent that you actually take His word seriously, and you're going to live by the principles established in them, Jesus says, or God says, that your legacy, your example, will actually reverberate from generation to generation. 